Well, I'm back now, and um, it's Wednesday morning, and I'm in another room with the HSLC, little recording room, and we were talking about um, neglect, <clears throat> and then we came down here to talk about Phineas Gage, and um, Phineas Gage had the ta uh, this uh, tamping iron go up through his prefrontal cortex. So uh, the only damage that we're talking, you know, when I'm asking you all these questions over here, I'm only talking about damage to the pre bilateral damage to the prefrontal cortex. Now, this prefrontal cortex is rostral to the premotor area, and we could just call it uh, prefrontal. And over here is here's the answer, all are true, all no, all no. But I thought it would be good for me to go through these uh, these names to make sure that you know what everything is, even though none of these are related to a lesion of the uh, prefrontal cortex, but there's still a lot of neuro in here. And as you know, I like to keep harping and harping to the very end about things that I, that I hope you carry forward, and this is one more chance. So here's some names that I hope you know. Um, first one, would, uh, with a lesion of the prefrontal cortex, would you get a contralateral homonymous hemianopia? Of course not. Um, but where would you get either a right or left homonymous hemianopia? Well, you could get them in, anywhere from the uh, lesions of the optic tract, lateral geniculate, and the entire optic radiations, uh, or the entire area 17 would give you a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Where, what is ataxia? Ataxia is just in coordination. Uh, how could you get a contralateral ataxia? Well, Let's see now, one good way of getting a contralateral atex, as far as I know, would be a lesion of the uh, inferior olive, because the olivocerebellar fibers are crossed. Ataxia. Now, this is not aphasia. This is not apraxia. It is not asteriognosia. It is not agnosia or any of those other things. It's ataxia. How could you get a, would you get a contralateral hemianesthesia from a lesion of the prefrontal cortex? No, you could not. This is, you're losing all sensation, say, on the opposite side. And in, um, in our cases, we, we did this with a lesion in the thalamus, VPL and VPM. Left neglect, you could not get that from a prefrontal cortex lesion. You could only get it from a right parietal lesion. You could also say parietal temporal, parietal temporal occipital back there. And uh, it has to be on the right hemisphere. It has to be on the right hemisphere. Left there, asteragnosia. You should all know the definition of asteragnosia. Inability to tell the structure or shape of something. And um, how could you get a left asteragnosia? Well, where could, how could you do this? Um, you could probably have lesions in the left dorsal columns up pretty rostral. Uh, you could have uh, lesions in the left nucleus, gracis, and uh, cuneatus, and then you could take it up in the uh, right medial lemniscus up to the thalamus, up to the cortex, asteriognosia. Dysarthria. Dysarthria is poor articulation of speech, and the classic place for a dysarthria is in cerebellum, where your speech is incoordinated. But as far as I'm concerned, any time you can't articulate, you could associate with lesions of something like the tongue or even the muscles of mastication or muscles of facial expression. They all are involved in the articulation of words. Dysteatococinesia is classic cerebellum. Can't supinate, pronate real fast. Ipsy dysteatococinesia, you could have a lesion in, the, in the, say, the cerebellum, the superior cerebellar peduncle before it crosses. You could have a lesion in the middle cerebellar peduncle, excuse me, or in the inferior cerebellar peduncle, ipsilateral dysteatococinesia. A left Hoffman sign, flicking of the finger, uh, the index finger and flexion of the hand, that's typically an upper motor neuron sign in the upper uh, cervical levels. You have to damage input, upper motor neuron input to the cervical levels. You know, I'm kidding with a left bang, bong, Babinski, you wouldn't get any. You wouldn't get those upper motor neuron signs with a prefrontal cortical lesion. Nystagmus be very difficult to get from a lesion of the prefrontal cortex. 
in most of the cases, you're going to have to have lesions down there around, oh, vestibular part of um, cranial nerve 8 or the vestibular nuclei. Uh, for the, some of you remember, you can also get some nystagmus from a lesion of the MLF, but I didn't go into those details. Deviation of the uvula to the left. Well, you know this is have to be a lower motor neuron problem. And uh, so you can't get this with cortical ball bars, but you can get deviation of the uvula with a lower motor neuron, either in uh, especially cranial nerve 10 or nucleus ambiguous. And remember, if you have a lesion in the right cranial nerve 10 or the right nucleus ambiguous, uvula is going to deviate to the strong side. Aphasia. Aphasia is a language problem, like a Broca's or a Wernicke's. And as you know, they are not located up here in the prefrontal cortex. Apraxia is a planning problem. And for apraxia, we have to have our lesions back in the supplementary motor area or in the lateral premotor area. And they're certainly caudal to where Phineas had his problems. You would not have a relative afferent pupil defect, no way. For me, you have to have, to get an RAPD, you gotta have a lesion in the optic nerve, in the optic nerve, in the optic nerve. How many times can I say it? Now, localization of the louder sound to the right ear in the Weber. Oh, I see. Well, certainly not gonna have a prefrontal cortical lesion giving any kind of Weber, Weber test. And um, in the Weber test, if you have a, a conductive problem, say on the right ear, and you do the tuning fork on your skull, you're going to hear it in the side with a conductive loss. An air bone gap in the left ear, no way. No way. Air bone gap would mean <clears throat> that there's a, a conductive loss in the left on the left side. It could be anywhere from maybe chopped off your outer ear, might even do it. Outer ear canal full of gunk. Uh, something wrong with your tympanic membrane. Maybe a scuba diver goes to goes down too far. You know, some people go to the Caribbean over spring break and, and, and scuba dive. Um, break, their, break their tympanic membrane. They're going to have a conductive loss. Uh, get in there, gunk on your malus incus, tapis, things like that. Tabes dorsalis, a word from the past. Uh, tabes dorsalis is one of the, the first kind of clinical syndromes or diseases associated with problems with the dorsal columns. Um, as sailors uh, in the 1800s would get uh, uh, from getting syphilis, uh, uh, whatever it is in syphilis attacks the dorsal columns and you get tabes dorsalis. And of course they might have also, the same sailors might have had a layer meat sign, which is just when you have a degeneration in the dorsal columns and you maybe flex your neck down, stretch the dorsal columns, you get all kinds of funny feelings. Tachycardia would be uh, for us, uh, and, and, and neuro, would, you could get tachycardia any way that would um, speed up the heart rate. So a lesion of dorsomotor 10, which normally kind of keeps it down, could give you tachycardia. Paranoid syndrome is a bilateral lesion of the superior colliculus. Superior colliculus would be in level 10 of the brainstem. You know, such a pineal tumor pushing down on the superior colliculi. Paranoid syndrome would be the inability to elevate your eyes. Bell's palsy, no way could you get it from a prefrontal. Bell's palsy's got to be a cranial nerve 7 in the periphery. So how could you get a Bell's palsy? Well, you could, um, you got to have some type of tumor growing in the internal auditory meatus. Um, what else here? Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. Usually associated dysphagia and dysphonia, inability to phonate to make noise. These are both associated with uh, nucleus ambiguous, cranial nerve 10 in the brainstem, a weak stylopharyngeus muscle that'd be associated with nucleus ambiguous and cranial nerve number nine. If Phineas had gunk coating his ossicles, that would mean the the, the mass would be increased. Of the, of the vibrating system, he would hear higher frequency sounds better than low. No, you, you increase the mass, you're going to hear lower better. Ptosis, could, this, could Phineas have had a ptosis? Um, no. How you get a ptosis? Well, you could have a Horner's, everybody knows that. 
Uh, so many, many spots all the way from the hypothalamus down to around T1 and give you ptosis. You can also get some problems with your levator with a cranial nerve 3 lesion. Uh, where are we here? Would plan for his retirement. No way. That's his executive cortex. Now here, that's one thing Phineas is, he's not going to plan ahead. He's not going to use that executive function to plan for his retirement. Would never use poor judgment. Well, poor Phineas, he did a lot of crazy things. So, of course, he didn't have good judgment. So, would never use, oh, yes, he would use poor judgment. Phineas would have damage to Myers Loop. Myers Loop is a vis part of the visual radiations uh, from the lateral geniculate body back to area 17. Myers Loop goes from the lateral geniculate to the lower bank of the calcarine. The lower bank of the calcarine sees the upper visual field. So if you had a lesion of uh, Myers Loop, you'd have a, uh, a um, quadrinopsia, upper quadrinopsia. Would have damage to 3, 1, and 2. Well, what is 3, 1, and 2? That's your primary sensory cortex. He's way rostral to it with this lesion. 3, 1, and 2 is sits, uh, it's also called the postcentral gyrus, caudal to the central sulcus, uh, partially supplied by the middle cerebral, and on the medial wall, the anterior cerebral for the leg. Would never relieve himself in public. Well, you know, he's got bad judgment, so of course he relieves himself in public. Phineas would complain that he is weak. No, he wouldn't complain that he's weak because the lesion is up here in the prefrontal cortex, far away from the motor strip. Would exhibit rigidity? No, poor Phineas wouldn't exhibit rigidity because rigidity is a sign of Parkinson's disease. It's different than spasticity. It's rigidity. It's like if you try to take a lead pipe in your hand and try to move it. Move it. That's rigidity. Would exhibit spasticity? No, that's a classic upper motor neuron sign. And again, we're far away from the primary motor cortex. Would have hemibolism. Well, you know, hemibolism is a classic sign associated rotary movements of the contralateral side after a lesion of the subthalamic nucleus. Please know this. And prosopagnosia? No, poor Phineas would not have prosopagnosia, inability to recognize faces. That's located further down in the temporal lobe. So this is a great review of a lot of neuro. And in this question right here, <clears throat> on your exam, you know, I might, I might say, I might use something else like, uh, um, you know, that you'll have to know what these terms are. So just don't memorize that all these are no. Please don't do that. That's not what I want. I want to help you, but, geez, I'm not going to. I'm not going to just, I don't want you to just memorize. Here's some more blood supply. Um, let's do, uh, let's see here. Look, look at, look how big that middle cerebral artery is. Wow. Here's the anterior. Here's the posterior. You got to be careful now. Posterior is going to get your, your occipital, your visual cortex. It's going to get this underside of the temporal lobe here. Now what's right in here is very important. Here's your Hippocampus would be deep to here. Your uncus and amygdala would be in here. So think about everything that's uh, functionally and behaviorally important that's in this base, of the, this ventral medial part of the temporal lobe. Here's your temporal lobe. Now certainly you've got temporal lobe here, but underneath here is very important that uh, Dave Van Lieshout talked about. So match the deficits well. Asteroagnosia would be the in inability to tell uh, shape or structure. Middle cerebral, well, if you blew out your middle cerebral, then you, if you had your hand, you couldn't, somebody put a cup of coffee in your hand, you wouldn't know it. Why the anterior cerebral? Well, maybe they put up, you know, something on your, on the base of your foot, and you could feel it, things like that. Maybe a pencil, you could roll a pencil on the bottom of your foot. So don't forget the anterior cerebral. Me memory deficits. Well, for me, it's mostly the, uh, the posterior cerebral artery, um, which would be right down in here, okay? Um, the reason that uh, I put middle is that there's some areas up in here called the dorsolateral uh, 
prefrontal cortex that's involved in something called working memory that probably any of you who ever took psychology courses, you learned working memory is, is also referred to as short-term memory, but I don't think that that has been emphasized. What we emphasized mostly was the hippocampus down here supplied by the posterior cerebral. Upper motor neuron, well, middle and anterior. Why middle and anterior? Well, here's your precentral gyrus, so you know the homunculus, how it's mapped down here. Hand, face, lips, all that down in here, and the leg on the medial wall. So here's your motor strip, here's your sensory strip. So this motor strip, where you could get, where you can get um, weakness, is supplied, part of your homunculus supplied by the middle, and over on the medial wall here, the leg area, the anterior cerebral. Fluent aphasia, fluent aphasia, Wernicke's, certainly, definitely right around here, so that's definitely middle. Broca's is right in here, that's definitely middle. Loss of ex executive function, well, that's poor Phineas. And um, I got some anterior cerebral right here, anterior cerebral right here. Okay, so this is your prefrontal cortex. And um, some middle cerebral right in here, prefrontal cortex right here. Okay. Um, apraxia, well, when I think of apraxia, I think of uh, area six up here. The lateral premotor area here would be supplied by the middle cerebral. The supplementary motor area would be supplied by some by the, the uh, middle cerebral, but also it goes onto the medial wall here and supplied by the anterior cerebral. So the anterior cerebral is going to get SMA, M1, and 3, 1, and 2, especially the leg areas. Non-fluent, that's a brocus. We just talked about that for being middle cerebral. Neglect. Neglect, I usually think of neglect being right around in here. This would be parietal, temporal, occipital, and that's mostly uh, middle cerebral. Um, smell deficits. Oh, my goodness. Smell deficits. Well, let's see. Here's the primary, there's some primary olfactory cortex in here. Here's your olfactory bulb and tract. This would all be anterior cerebral. But then you've got all that cortex overlying the hippocampus here. This medial, ventral medial cortex here would be primary olfactory cortex. So definitely posterior cerebral. Hearing related deficits. Well, for me, primary auditory cortex is right in here. And that would certainly be middle cerebral. Primary 41, 42. You pull open this lateral fissure, you can see the primary auditory cortex. And then we jump to a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Well, how could you get that? Well, you're certainly going to get the, if you blew out your posterior cerebral artery back here, you'd get a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. And then don't forget, Myers loop is coming back. This lateral genetic would be right deep here. So some of those fibers in Myers loop are running deep in the temporal lobe, and some of the fibers in the other fibers in the optic radiations are running more dorsally here, deep in the parietal lobe. So you can see that if you had big uh, blowouts of the middle cerebral, you could get some of those optic radiations if you're up in here or if you're down in here. So this would be middle and this would be posterior. That's, that's very important clinically. So I think you'll be able to handle this question. Brain stent. Now this, I just wanted you to be able to, to know what happens when you blow out your vertebral basilar system. Here are your vertebrals. Here's your basilar. Here's your posterior cerebral. So this vertebral basilar system supplies all the brain stem here. And then the posterior cerebral, you know, some branches go into the thalamus. And then we've just been talking about <clears throat> those branches that go up and get... Um, the primary visual cortex, and the, the base of the, of the um, temporal lobe, which we just talked about. So what I've picked over here, over here are lots and lots of things that I uh, either want you to know why you would get, the, if, do you get a deficit if you blow out part of the vertebral base or uh, system, and why? So why would you, would you get nystagmus? Well, you could. Brain stem's got cranial nerve eight, Brain stem's got the vestibular nuclei. Would you get atrophy? Yep, all oh, those cranial nerves, oh my gosh. 
think about all the cranial nerves that are, you know, from 2 to two to 12, or, uh, yeah, sorry, 3 to 12, you're going to get a lot, you could get a lot of atrophy by problems in the brainstem. Upper motor neuron, why? You get the cortical spinal tract. My gosh. Horners, why? You get the good old ALS and descending autonomics. Ooh. Bell's palsy, cranial nerve 7. Intention, tre intention tremor. That's Now, Pierre, uh, I hope you remember what intention tremor is at basal ganglia or is that cerebellar. Well, intention tremor would be the cerebellum, certainly supplied by the vertebral basilar system. Here's a classic cerebellar deficit, dystiodocokinesia. Here are some classic signs of Parkinson's. Well, why would blow out of the vertebral basilar system give you classic Parkinson's signs? Well, think about it up here in the midbrain. You've got the substantia nigra. Dysphagia, dysphonia, cranial nerve 10. Deafness, cranial nerve 8. All the auditory pathways, remember that? Well, especially if you get the nerve or the dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei. Double vision, come on. You've got cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 to take care of that. Head tilt, well, you got to think now. Why would I tilt my head? Well, to correct vision. Well, would it, is, it, is it head tilt or head rotation? If it's head tilt, it's a cranial nerve 4 problem to correct it. If it's head rotation, it's a cranial nerve 6. Efferent pupil, well, certainly cranial nerve 3, edinger westfall nucleus. Diminution of saliva, well, brainstem certainly has the inferior salivatory nucleus, superior salivatory nucleus. Rebound, classic cerebellum sign. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, that's just another name for an MLF lesion. So if you had a lesion, and uh, if you knocked out the blood supply to the MLF, you have the inability to turn the IPSI immediately. Loss of taste, whoa. Cranial nerve, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, solitary complex, things like that. Why did I put rebound in here again? Did I have rebound up there? Well, rebound, I, I guess it's just that I love rebound. Cerebellar, contralateral homonymous. Well, wait a minute. Contralateral homonymous in a brainstem? No posterior cerebral artery, contralateral upper quadrinopia. Why? Well, posterior cerebral, you know, you don't have to blow out the whole, the whole visual cortex, but you could just, uh, for a contralateral upper, you could blow out um, the ventral bank, okay, with a, with a select occlusion of the posterior cerebral. Dysarthria, <clears throat> poor articulation, Classic would be cerebellum, but of course you got your hypoglossal nucleus in there, you got your motor five, you got your motor seven. When I think of nausea and vomiting, I always think of the vestibular system, cranial nerve eight. What a great review. Vertebral basilar. Compare the vertebral basilar with that internal carotid uh, blood supply. Be able to do that. It's a good slide, I like it. Blood, it uh, reviews the blood supply and also gives me a chance to uh, go back to some things that you've learned earlier and that uh, it kind of integrates a little bit. Let's see, where's A? I can't even find A. A, 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 A. Where's A? G, D, C, E, E. I don't know. A! Oh, gosh. Seven and eight going in the internal auditory meatus. Uh, where does B penetrate the dura? Well, posterior cranial fossa. This is cranial nerve 6, abducens. If you had a lesion of this, you would uh, rotate your head toward the lesion to correct double vision. Um, okay, rotate. What's uh, cranial nerve 6? We did that. Uh, D, yeah, anterior communicating. And yes, it does have many little aneurysms on it. And look what's around here. The optic nerve, the optic chiasm right here. So you can come up with lots of good things there. Uh, let's see, F right here. Well, looks like that's V1. There's V2, V3. V1 goes through the superior orbital fissure. V2 goes through foramen rotundum. V3 goes through foramen ovale. H is the pons, and, um, you know, if we had a lesion down in here, 
And uh, <clears throat> if we got the cortical spinals, you'd have a contralateral hemiplegia. If we had a lesion down here and got the basilar pontine gray, you'd have contralateral incoordination. C is cranial nerve three that <clears throat> can be affected by the posterior cerebral giving a little blab or by the superior cerebellar artery giving a little blab. Uh, what else? I would be ACA. I would be ACA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And I think that's about, oh, G right here would be the anterior cerebral artery coming up. Remember, these are your anterior cerebrals coming up here. Uh, anything else? I think I got almost everything. Let's see. Yeah, H, no arrow. Sits on the pons, on the lesion that penetrates in it, can interrupt cortical spinals around contralateral spine. Yep, darn right. Well, this is a good one. This is on there. This is on there. Well, let's say, for instance, I had right here a, um, a lesion of the uh, entire eighth nerve here. So you get the auditory and vestibular part. Which way, which way would you stumble? Well, you would stumble ipsilateral. Which way would your nystagmus be? Contra. Which ear would you be deaf in? Ipsy. And would that deafness, uh, would that be con a conductive or sensory neural loss? It'd be a sensory neural loss. Uh, what else could I ask you here? Um, 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 um. You had a lesion here. Would you have a relative afferent pupil defect? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. If you had a lesion in the chiasm, no, 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 no. If you had a lesion in the optic tract, no, no, no. If you had a lesion in C, of course you wouldn't have a relative afferent pupil defect. You'd have a blown pupil. That pupil would be big and open and never react. Here's your olfactory nerve or tract. It's the tract. Here's the tract. All right. Anything else I could quiz you on here? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's pretty good. Um, oh, I know. I could say, um, where are the motor fibers in cranial nerve 7 that are going through the internal auditory meatus? Where are they going to exit the skull? Hmm. Well, stylomastoid foramen. Um, I could say cranial nerve 7. What about the, um, the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers that are going to head for the pterygopalatine ganglion. What nerve will that eventually become? Greater petrosal. You know that. See how many little questions I can ask you? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to help you. H-E-L-P. I want you to kind of integrate as much as you can, but I also want you to enjoy it. Enjoy it. This is on the exam, and I know you're going to say, well, you know, what the heck? We... You oddly went over these sections. Well, this is a frontal section, pretty far rostral. Here's your corpus callosum. Here's your lateral ventricle, your lateral ventricle. Caudate, caudate, putamen, putamen. You're going to say, where's the thalamus? You always told me the thalamus. You know, I got to know the thalamus. There is no thalamus here. We're rostral to it. So you have to relax. We'll get to it. Now, this is the striatum. We don't have any thalamus in this section, so this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule. This, uh, what else do we need here? D? You all know what D is. Let's go down to D. Where is D? D, 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 D. D. Le a lesion of D, which is the optic chiasm, gives you a relative afferent pupil. No, no. Uh, e is the olfactory tract right here. So the cell bodies of the olfactory tract would be in the olfactory bulb. I say wait for Van the man. He already gave that lecture. Occlusion of H can result in a Broca's aphasia. Well, what is H? What is H? Can it? Depending, if it's, on, if it's on the left side, middle cerebral, you're darn right. This is your middle cerebral right here, coming out the lateral fissure. Can the anterior limb or internal capsule be? Yeah. Well, how do you know that's the anterior limb, Big John? Because you don't have any thalamus here. This is all striatum, caudate, putamen. You don't have any thalamus. You have to have, a, you, you know, think about a horizontal section. You have to have thalamus to get the posterior limb. Something I didn't emphasize, and I'm really sorry. I'm always apologizing, but these G, G fibers coming off here are the lateral striate arteries. 
and these lateral striate arteries supply <clears throat> parts of the internal capsule. Lateral striates get, especially the, some of them supply the, the posterior limb, but the posterior limb is also supplied by the anterior choroidal. Don't forget that. Very good. I love this section. You're going to see this section on the exam. Oh, there's the pituitary and the cavernous sinus. Oh, my gosh. Think about the things in the cavernous sinus. Oh, my gosh. We even had, I think we had a case on that. Think about what produces the fluid in here. This is something we haven't talked about, corpus callosum. Some of you might know that this is a singular gyrus. I would not expect you to know that, but you know it now. And if I asked you the thalamic nucleus that projects to the singular gyrus, I probably, maybe 10% of you might know if you've done the thalamus. It would be the anterior nucleus of the thalamus projects to the singular gyrus. Of course, I could ask you the blood supply to that. Oh, yes. Well, it's on the medial wall, so what do you think it is? So, anterior cerebral. Anterior cerebral. See how much you know? You know much more than, than uh, you think. Oh, the internal capsule. Well, I like this one on the left because this is the one you'll see on national boards. This is the one you'll see on national boards. This is the this would be your forehead. Back here is the back of your head. Here's your cerebellum. Here's your area 17. I don't know what was going on here. I love CCC, 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 retro, retro lenticular limb of the internal capsule. Why is it retro? Because here's your lenticular nucleus. It's behind it, retro lenticular. Where would be the sub? Underneath this, more ventral. I already showed you that. This is great. Caudate and thalamus are medial to the internal capsule. Caudate and thalamus are medial to the internal capsule. Caudate, and, we already said that. Lateral to the internal capsule would be putamen and globus pallidus, better known as the lenticular nucleus. The caudate and the putamen are the striatum. The putamen and the globus pallidus right here would be the lenticular nucleus. So here is, B would be the anterior limb. G is the genu, and A is the posterior limb. The genu has the cortical bulbar fibers in it. If you had a lesion of the genu, you don't have any cortical spinal damage, but you have your cortical bulbars. So your tongue would go contra, your face would be weak contra below the eyes. Everything else would be okay. Back in here, you have your cortical spinals, so you can have contralateral upper motor neuron damage, contralateral, all the classic signs. You also have somatosensory pathways going through here from the thalamus, from the thalamus to the cortex, very diffusely distributed throughout this posterior limb. Cortical spinals, you blow out your posterior limb, good chance you're going to get all your cortical spinals. Blow out some of the posterior limb, Somatosensory deficits are not going to be as, as, as concentrated. As con the fibers aren't as concentrated, diffusely organized through here. Here's your hippocampus for memory. Hippocampus, your retrolenticular. Here's your superior colliculus. So remember, a, bila a big pineal tumor pressing on the superior colliculus would give you paranoid syndrome. Here's your thalamus, big thalamus. Here's your third ventricle. Here are your lateral ventricles. Here's a little piece of the fornix right here. The good, good slide. Um, over here, kind of shows we're looking, coming in laterally. So we're looking at the putamen, like right coming in this way. We're looking at the putamen. Globus pallidus would be medial to it. You can see a little piece of the caudate. You can see the anterior limb, the genu, posterior limb, retrolenticular. Here's the tail of the caudate. Down here is brainstem, cerebellum, some nerves down here. So I think I probably answered most of the questions down here. Um, I think you'll, you'll, you will see this. Let's just say, what if you had a big, well, let's say you blew out your uh, posterior limb, you know, cortical spinals, gain cortical bulbars. You know I haven't emphasized much the anterior limb. There's some thalamocorticals in there, and there's some... Uh, 
cortical pontines in here. Here's a nice big caudate. Um, hippocampus, uh, bilateral lesions of the hippocampus. The most famous patient was um, HM. Couldn't remember anything from that day forward. Cerebellum, you know, ataxia, and all the classic signs. Area 17, mostly supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. <clears throat> this just shows the sublenticular limb right here. Right here, we did this. Here's your posterior limb. Here, look how big the thalamus is here. Now we're getting caudal. You can tell from here. So we're, the thalamus is big. The, the uh, lenticular nucleus is pretty small. And uh, of course, if we went rostral from here, this lenticular nucleus would get bigger. See, next section, it would get bigger and the thalamus would get smaller. Here's your fornix up here, your corpus callosum, cingulate gyrus. Looks like a little hippocampus here, cerebral peduncle. Think of all the goodies in the cerebral peduncle. Substantia nigra, right there. Don't confuse it with a subthalamic nucleus. The way I remember it is the nigra always sits on the peduncle. The subthalamic nucleus never sits on the peduncle. Classic sign of a, of a subthalamic nucleus lesion is contralateral hemibolism. Here's your optic tract right, hidden right in here. If you had a lesion of that, you'd have a contralateral homonymous hemianopia with no relative afferent pupil defect. All these fibers in the sublenticular branch of the internal capsule are coming from the medial geniculate body of the thalamus, and they are going out into the core. They're going out into temporal cortex to primary auditory cortex. Now we're talking about a hypothalamus. Um, I love the hypothalamus. Um, Dave divided it into three levels: the, the chiasm. There's a level of the chiasm. There's a tuberal level and there's a mammillary level. Uh, this would be at the mammillary level right here. These are the mammillary bodies. Here's your hippocampus down here, corpus callosum, cingulate gyrus. Here are your lateral ventricles. Look at the thalamus. Boy, is that a gorgeous MD thalamus here. Here, not too big of a lenticular nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus. Here's your hypothalamus. This is the caudal hypothalamus. How do I know it's the caudal? The mammillary bodies. Mammillary bodies are right there. I look at this one, pretty much the same thing. Mammillary bodies are the ones identified. What are we doing? This is the middle area of the hypothalamus, the middle, the tuberal region right here. How do I know it? Well, I can see the fornix right here dividing. See the fornix here? And here's the fornix. Here's the thalamus up here. Here's the lenticular nucleus. Here's the ansa coming around the bend. Here's your, oh, look at this nice solid structure here. That's your almond. That's your amygdala. It looks pretty good. Um, what's important here is that here's your fornix right here, and it divides the hypothalamus, hypo, below. Here's what we call the thalamus proper or dorsal thalamus. Here's your anterior nucleus. Here's your fornix again. Fornix is cut here. Fornix is cut here. Why? Because this fornix is, 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 actually this is going a little rostral. This is coming back to eventually go down into the mammillary bodies. Remember, this, is, this level is rostral to this level. There's a little, there's a ventral medial area here. If you have a lesion, you eat too much. There's a lateral area, the lateral, th area of the hypothalamus that if you have a lesion here, you, you don't eat. And then this little area down here is called the arcuate nucleus, and your key thought for the arcuate nucleus is releasing hormones. Releasing hormones, rat will eat too much, rat won't eat enough. Almond, almond here, the amygdala, this, uh, remember the lady who had bilateral lesions of her amygdala and she wasn't afraid of anybody. So that's involved in the fear response and lots and lots of other things. Over here, or what are we pointing to here? Here I'm pointing to ventral medial where you eat too much. Here I'm pointing to the lateral hypothalamic area where you don't eat enough. Uh, I got this little marker here on what is called the insular, insular, insular cortex. So here's your lenticular. So if you open up this lateral fissure, you see what's called the insular cortex. 
and Dave talked about the importance of insular cortex in uh, flavor. There are also classic studies where people with lesions, uh, there's a group of people with lesions, strokes, in this insular cortex, and they immediately stop smoking. So this area also has something to do with addiction. Ah, uh, mammary bodies, hippo, yep, all curled up. I think you're okay with this one. Uh, anything else I think you should know on this? Um, I don't think so. Caudal hypothalamus. Caudal hypothalamus because of the mammary bodies. Oh, mammary bodies. Let's see, what projects to the mammary bodies would be the uh, hippocampus via the fornix. And, uh, by, you know, when these things... You know, if you look at the pathology of, of, of people who have been drinking a lot, this will shrink up for Korsakoff syndrome. I don't think we emphasize that, but they confabulate, they tell stories. So because it gets input from the fornix, which starts in the hippocampus here, it's got some issue, it plays some role in, the, um, in memory. Um, I think that's it. Oh, projects via the MTT. Well, this gets input from the hip from the fornix via the from the hippocampus via the fornix and then it's going to project up to the anterior nuclei so it's going to project up here now for those who really want to know it here's mammalothalamic mammalothalamic this little bundle right here going up started in the mammillary bodies here and goes up into the anterior nucleus the anterior nucleus then projects to the cingulate gyrus. Here's some more. Um, now we're at the rostral part of the hypothalamus. So this is the rostral part of the hypothalamus. This is the rostral part of the hypothalamus. This is the middle part, or the tuberal level. Tuberal level. Remember when I said tuberal, remember? We had uh, lesions here, you, you eat too much, here you don't eat at all, and then I talked about the arcuate nucleus down here for the main key thought was uh, releasing hormones. We come up here now, we're in the rostral part of the hypothalamus because here's the optic chiasm, okay? Here again, this has got to be posterior limb. Why do I know that? Well, look at that big thalamus there. Anytime you got thalamus, you got posterior limb. We don't have a good section through the gainu. Here's your lenticular nucleus again laterally. Here's your caudate and thalamus. I told you, no matter how you cut it, the caudate and the thalamus are medial to the internal capsule. Then you come down here to the chiasm. Remember, you've got a suprachiasmatic nucleus sitting on the chiasm, a supraoptic nucleus sitting wedged up here a little further away, right in this little wedge, and then you've got a paraventricular nucleus right here. So when I think about the supra chiasmatic nucleus, which is not shown here, but it sits on the chiasm. I just think circadian rhythms. When I think about the supraoptic nucleus, I think about uh, vasopressin and uh, oxytocin. When I think about the paraventricular, that is next to the ventricle, I think about vasopressin, oxytocin, and CRH. And I think you can answer any question we might ask you on that. Now, Kluver Busey, what did Kluver and Busey do? Well, they took out the temporal lobes. So just think about what's in the temporal lobes. Well, you've got the, the, prim you've got the primary olfactory cortex, you've got the hippocampus, you've got the amygdala. So you can kind of think about, I'll, I'll leave this with you, but this is on the exam because if you know about the Kluver-Busey syndrome, you will know about the structure, about the functions of this area. So you would expect a Kluver-Busey monkey where they took out this ventral medial temporal lobe. Maybe they have some memory problems. If they took out the almond, they're not going to be afraid of anything. And because this area has close connections with, uh, with the hypothalamus, they're going to be hyperphagic. And um, because it has close connections with the hypothalamus, they're going to be hypersexual. And I think, I, I don't remember what else Dave talked about, but those are the important ones to me. They're, they put all kinds of things in their mouth. They're docile, hyperphagia, hypersexual. Um, so anything else, that, I want you to make sure you read about Kluver-Busey. 
I'm not trying to give you more work. I'm trying to give you a clue to what's going on in this area down here. Now, structure A would be the uh, olfactory bulb. So the nerve, the nerve, olfactory nerve comes up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and synapses in the bulb. The bulb gives rise to fibers in the tract, and they go back into this area right here, C. And remember the anti uh, anterior perforated substance in here? This is all your primary smell cortex. Now, you know, from this cortex, it can actually then go to the thalamus, go back to thalamus, and then it can go to the MD and things like that, and then go out to insular cortex and prefrontal cortex. So this old system of smell is, is kind of different. Um, what else? Do I, oh, let's do this. What's this thing out? Phineas cortex. So, of course, this would be the, the base of your prefrontal cortex. The uncus would be right there. And the uncus, you know, herniates. The uncus herniates, and it overlies overlies the uh, the amygdala. So think about w when we did our uncle herniation, that went down through the tentorium and put pressure on this cerebral peduncle here and the third nerve. Uh, what else did I ask? Uh, primary olfactory cortex penetrated by lateral strides. Yeah, up in there, lateral strides are branches of the middle cerebral. All right, over here, I'm just pointing to the arcuate nucleus. And all I really want you to know, here are releasing hormones. A couple more. Uh, super optic, super I don't know. Maybe I should be calling that super cosmetic right there, I bet. Um, but anyway, super optic would be kind of in here more. Super of course, would be, oh, look, I misnamed it. Oh, John. This would be a suprachiasmatic nucleus, circadian rhythms. How could I do that? Well, I guess I can't ask that on an exam, darn it. Okay. Here's GPI, GPE. What's this pointing to? The fornix here. Here's another piece of the fornix here a little bit. So you'd have suprachiasmatic, supraoptic paraventricular. You'd have a nice anterior nucleus of the thalamus, a nice VAVL, a nice posterior limb, a nice lenticular nucleus here. Uh, these little arrows are designating the VAVL. VA, how do I know it's VAVL? Sometimes you can actually see the ANSA coming around the bend, coming out of GPI around the bend. So we're pretty far forward. So this has got to be VAVL. Over here, I'm showing the retrolenticular limb of the internal cap. So why? Well, it, it, there's a clue here because here's the lateral geniculate. Here's the medial geniculate. This looks like midbrain to you, doesn't it? Cerebral peduncle, substantia nigra. Here's a little piece of the pons. Uh, here's your pineal. Here's your fornix, lateral ventricles. But there's no lenticular nucleus here. So we're behind it, retrolenticular. Here's your lateral geniculate body, which is a good clue because you know cells in the lateral geniculate body send their axons in the retrolenticular limb of the internal capsule. This little piece coming off the fornix, how do you know this is fornix and not amygdala, something solid like this? Because it's kind of coiled up and it's got the fornix coming off of it. This fornix is going to actually be continuous with this fornix right here. As it goes rostral, it'll eventually dive into the mammillary bodies. So here's your cerebral peduncle, your nigra, little ruber duber. Got some very interesting. Here's your cerebral aqueduct right there. Here's your hippo with the fornix coming off it. Retrolenticular limb of the internal capsule. And this, these blue pointers here are pointing to the good old lateral geniculate. Of course, if you got a lateral geniculate body, you got to have a what? A medial geniculate body. This is great. I love this one because it is actually what you're going to see. Here's the, uh, again, here's your forehead. Back here is your visual cortex. Medial here with a lesion in it. Look at that lesion. Is the thalamus is B. The caudate is A. This would be the anterior limb. This little yellow thing would be the gainin. C would be the posterior limb. This red marker would be the retrolenticular limb of the internal capsule. You can see this is a, one of Dave's cases where he had a lesion in the in the thalamus right here, and um, you know these lesions in the thalamus, 
you know, you might say, well, geez, if, maybe this is VPM, VPL, some, some, somewhere back there. You say, gee, you just lose everything. You're not going to have any sensation. Well, you can, it, that can happen, but it also you have some funny reorganization going on in here. And remember the thalamic syndrome. I want you to know this. Thalamic syndrome, you're going to have hyperpathia, hyperalgesia, and allodynia. Please know these three terms. Okay, so thalamic lesions right there, thalamic syndrome right here, hyperpathia, hyperalgesia, allodynia. Know these three terms. Um, this very happens quite often. This is, you know, painful reactions to non-painful stimuli, allodynia. This is nasty. They have conventions uh, to study allodynia every year. These other two, I'll let you up to you to determine what the difference is between hyperpathia and hyperalgesia. And uh, you'll certainly see this on the exam. If you got any questions, you can just email me. Oh, this is hypothalamus. I got a long email from somebody asking me to identify these structures, which I did gratefully because I love this section. Um, let's go through what A is. A right here. Anybody know what A is? Well, here's the thalamus right here, right here. Here's the corpus callosum M. Let's see, cell bodies of A. Well, it's the fornix, okay? A classic view of the fornix, cell bodies would be in the hippocampus. Where it could it terminate? It could terminate in the mammillary bodies. Uh, F is the pineal. It could push down on the superior colliculus and call, cause perinatal syndrome, inability to elevate your eyes. H is the good old inferior colliculus, part of the auditory pathways. And I wonder how many people remember where the inferior colliculus projects. It projects to the medial geniculate body via the brachium, the brachium or arm of the inferior colliculus. It would receive in ascending auditory input from the lateral lemniscus. The lateral lemniscus, don't confuse the lateral lemniscus with the medial lemniscus. Here's your fourth ventricle. Wow. Here's your cerebellum, classic cerebellum. J would be what? Well, J is the pons. K, there's kind of, this is midbrain, midbrainy looking here. Remember our level 10 would go like this. So K's got to be a big nerve coming out of the midbrain, and it's coming off the ventral surface of the midbrain, not coming off the dorsal surface. So off the dorsal surface would be cranial nerve 4, off the ventral surface of the midbrain, cranial nerve 3. Here's your mammillary bodies. So this is hypothalamus, hypothalamus. This is thalamus, hypothalamus right here. So here's your mammillary bodies, a little bit of, oh, D. What did I say D is? Let's ask, is D the optic nerve or tract? Hmm, it's a nerve, yep, nerve, because back in here would be the chiasm. Here's a little interesting little artery connecting the two anterior cerebrals called the anterior communicating artery. Here's your interventricular, oh, here's your interventricular foramen of Monroe leading from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. Here is a little choroid plexus right here. And we had our hydrocephalus case yesterday, and Bob did a great job. Bob did a great job, except Bob was down here, and he said, well, how does the CSF get out of the fourth ventricle? Well, there is one foramen of Montjandy, Montjandy, as Pierre would say, and there's two foramen of Lushkas, two foramen of Lushkas laterally. One Mojandi, two lateral Lushkas. All right, good. Oh, I got a lot of questions on this. What is this? I like this because I don't think I've emphasized enough of spatial relationships and, you know, people saying, you know, I didn't get to cut the brain up. I don't know where the front, the back, the top, the bottom is. So I put this in here so that, you know, it's kind of cool. I like it anyway. So, you know, here's the eyeballs. I hope everybody can get that right. And I bet you A is a what? A must be the optic nerve. Well, sure, I could, ooh, I could cut this. And I could say, how much of the world can this person see? Or I could say, I could cut this. Does this person have a relative afferent pupil defect? Oh, I could, I could certainly ask that, yeah. And then I could go back to B. B, what did I say about B? B is the... 
It's the poons. The poons. Yes, it is the poons. And, uh, you know, Pontine Gray, we know, we talked about that. Lesion of the Pontine Gray would give you a contralateral incoordination. I will tell you again that it's, con oh, yeah, I did that. Okay. E is the fourth ventricle. Did that. What could I ask you about that? Oh, I know. Is there more CSF in the ventricular system or subarachnoid space? And you should say subarachnoid space. C is the thalamus. Yes. Yes. Can you see the lateral geniculate body? Oh, my goodness. Oh, there it is right there. So that's C is the thalamus. And D, think D is. D is the anterior horn. Yeah, this is all the ventricular system. Look at this. This would be the anterior horn. Uh, did I ask you what F is? Well, this is kind of what we call the, a point here. This would all be posterior horn. This is your inferior horn of uh, the lateral ventricle, anterior horn. And this is what we call kind of the trigone area where the, everything kind of, this goes posterior, this goes down into the temporal lobe. I guess I didn't ask a question on that. Let's see, uh, yes, blood supply to this. Blood supply to eyes, the anterior, is that true? Anterior cerebral, darn right. What would be on the medial wall here in motor, motor cortex, leg, sensory cortex, leg. Also some planning up here, SMA. So this would all be supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Good. Now this, now we'll just briefly go through the cases because I did these really fast for you. Um, this shows an uncle herniation right here, uncle herniation, that would press on this cerebral peduncle and give you a contralateral hemiplegia. Could press on this third nerve and give you an ipsilateral dilated pupil. Eventually, this will push this other cerebral peduncle into the free border of the tentorium. This is called Kernahan's notch. Now you will get a hemiplegia contra to this. So if you add this up with this, you get bilateral hemiplegia. You get this, one of the first signs though, when this uncus herniates down through, again, think what's in here now, the uncus, olfactory cortex, so the person might have some smell defects because this is happening, not defects, kind of hallucinations of smell. First thing would happen when it herniates, you're gonna get a dilated pupil, that's, that's scary. Then you're gonna get a contra hemiplegia, then you're gonna get a bilateral hemiplegia. Remember now, when you, when you do this, you can also squeeze the posterior cerebral artery in here too. And that of course can lead to, you know what can happen there. If you squeeze that posterior cerebral artery, that goes up to area 17. So while the person probably wouldn't live long enough, you could, if you've squeezed that posterior cerebral artery, you could get a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So here's three. Here's your optic nerve chiasm tract. Uh, here'd be the cerebral aqueduct, cerebral peduncle, a little piece of the nigrin here, hard to tell. So rostral is going down this way, rostral. Now, Mick sent me an email about this because I've got this related to a case where I think I had a left intraparenchymal bleed, and uh, this is the right side. So this figure here is not from that CAT scan that I had in the case. This is a different different um, brain from that case. Parkinson's, I don't think I need to go very long about this. We all know Parkinson's. I've harped upon it. You're gonna see this. This right here, why? He does not have a tremor when he moves. He has a tremor, he or she has a tremor when he rests. Of course it's gonna be hard to button your, button your blazer because you can't move and you've got some rigidity. You also have micrographia. This case, classic. We spent a lot of time on this. And also, I forgot, you also have these um, on, 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 uh, on electric capture. So this, when I look at this, I go right there and say, what happened to the striatum? The caudate shrunk and the, the putamen shrunk, and this is Huntington's chorea. And uh, so you could say, oh, maybe all the cells in the striatum that project the GPE died, or maybe all those cholinergic neurons died. Um, this would be the caudate, this would be the anterior limb, this would be the putamen. Uh, what else would I want you to know? Lateral ventricle here, 
big lateral ventricle here, corpus callosum. Uh, e, the medial side of the hemisphere, so perhaps what am I going to see? Blood supply to E, anterior cerebral, you're darn right. Uh, I think that's good enough. We, so you have lecture capture for this. Uh, too much movement, way too much movement, Huntington's. So you think about, would you give them dopamine or a dopamine antagonist? Would you give them acetylcholine or an acetylcholine antagonist? That's what I want you to know. Cerebellum, my goodness, we've gone on and on, but here are the deep nuclei right here. Here's your cortical spinals, cortical bulbars, cortical pontines. So think about what you could get with your cortical spinals here on the contra side. Here's your fab four, love it. Anybody remember what's in the fab four? Let me see if I can remember. Medial lemniscus, ALS, etc. TTT and descending, hypothalamics. Here's your good old MLF. Ooh, does anybody remember the MLF? Well, why don't I review it? I got one more time here. MLF cell bodies of this MLF are in the contralateral abducens nucleus, which is in the pons. Where do these axons end? In the ipsilateral ocular motor nucleus, especially on cells that innervate the medial rectus. So a lesion here, you cannot turn this eye immediately, either voluntarily or using the vestibular ocular reflex. This is classic deep cerebellar nuclei. This is classic superior cerebellar peduncle. So this peduncle is going to go rostral, cross, give some fibers to the ruber, and go through it and give some fibers to VAVL. So lesions in here, ipsilateral problems. Lesions here, ipsilateral problems. Lesion here, ipsilateral problems. What turns on the deep nuclei? Well, fibers, mossy fiber collaterals, climbing fiber collaterals. Um, what also projects back down upon this would be inhibitory axons from the, would it be Purkinje cells, granule cells, basket? Nope, Purkinje cells. This looks like a, one of the best looking dentates I've ever seen. Dentate inter, sorry, I-N, Globos, G-L-O, emboliform, E-M, <laughs> festigial, F-A, stigial. This would be some what? Some fourth ventricle. Oh, my goodness. Boy, there's a lot of stuff on here. Uh, let's see. Let me ask you one thing down here. Um, if you lost your cortical spinals here, would you, would you have what on the contralateral foot, would, you, would your plantar reflex be flexor or extensor? And I say extensor. Uh, I think that's good enough. All right, that's cool. This is cerebellum. Good review of cerebellum. You'll never see better deep nuclei. Why are they deep nuclei? They're deep in the white matter. Here's your cortex. Now, here is where you'd have the three layers, granule, Purkinje, and molecular, each one in here. So when uh, yesterday when... when um, I forget who it was, showed uh, the difference. I think it was Jamie. She showed difference between, between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex. This is cerebellar cortex. It's got three layers. Cerebral, cerebral has six layers. And um, I think that's all I'll say about it. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. We did this, oh my gosh, right there in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. You couldn't see it any better. Here's your anterior limb. Here's your gain hoop posterior limb. This is your forehead. This is the back of your head. Posterior limb's got those cortical spinal fibers in it. So you'd have a contralateral upper motor neuron deficit. Now this same posterior limb, right, hard to see in this room, this posterior limb can be seen right here. Okay, because here's our planus section. Anterior, gainu, posterior, retro. So now we're cutting right through here. You see the lenticular nucleus is getting smaller, but look how big the thalamus is. Posterior limb, remember it gets a dual blood supply. It gets a dual blood supply. I'll say it one more time. It gets a dual blood supply. Some of it comes from the lateral striate arteries. So here's your posterior limb in this schematic. Some of the blood supply comes from the, la the strides, lateral strides from the middle cerebral. Some of it comes as its own branch, as anterior choroidal. So if you blow out either one of these, anterior choroidal or lateral strides, the axons coursing through here are going to be interrupted. 
Um, I'm, let's see what else I've shown here. Um, here would be up in here. I think I'm probably trying to show the Fornix on that one. Here would be the Optic Tract. Here's that Fornix again. So if we're looking at this level, would you eat too much or too little if you had a lesion here? You'd eat too much, like me. Now, if you had a lesion lateral to the fornix, would you eat too much or too little? You'd eat too little, unlike me. Here's your optic tract. Would you have a relative afferent pupil defect? Of course not. Would you have a contralateral homonymous hemianopia? Of course you would. What else do I have? I'm looking for all the things I label. I can't even see them. Anyway. So this is a pretty good one. Um, let's go, let's see, what else? Uh, anything else in here? Nope, next one. All right, we did this. Oh, here's my, this is a case, this is a case in which I had a pure lesion in the thalamus here. And um, so this would be VPM, this would be VPL. How do I know? That's kind of, you know, geez. Used to be when we had a lot of time in the course, we'd point to VPM and say, oh, you know, there's not much myelin here. Not much myelin here. Well, and then when we do the VPL here, there's a lot more myelin. Here's a little MD, fornix, little twig here, caudate. I don't, oh, maybe, maybe. Oh, I don't think there's any lenticular nucleus here, but somebody might try to, I don't know. That could be busting in right there. Uh, here's your cerebral peduncle. What always sits on the peduncle is a Niagara. The ruber duber never goes away. Oh, I know. If I had a lesion in the ruber duber here, would I have an ipsilateral or contralateral motor problem? Well, if I'm in the ruber duber itself, it's contra. If I'm in the rubrospinal tract itself, it's an ipsilateral problem. Here's MD up here. It's probably the only, this gets much, much, much bigger. Uh, hippo is a hippo. I love the hippo. And always the hippo has the fornix coming off it which is looping over, and it's actually continuous with this fornix, which will go rostral and dive into the mammillary bodies. Uh, let's see here. What patient lost both their hippos, HM? Uh, could he remember his favorite? Yes, he could remember his favorite grade school teacher because that's a long time ago. But could he remember his surgeon's name? No, because that's more of a recent memory. Uh, B, what did I ask for B? Where is B? Come on, John, where's a B? I didn't even ask anything about B. Uh, looks like B is a, you know, this would be the lateral fissure here and maybe some insular cortex. I don't know if I ask anything about B. Why did I label it? But anyway, you know me. And A, a looks like cingulate cortex, so that would be supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and actually gets input from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Here's your corpus callosum right there. Uh, so something about, uh, can you see the cerebral peduncle? Of course you can see the cerebral peduncle. It's kind of continuous with the posterior limb. Can you see the cerebral peduncle? Well, once you see that, remember now, this is the smart peduncle. So you're going to have all your cortical bulbars in here. You're going to have all your cortical spinals in here. You're going to have all of your cortical pontines. So let's do this. This might be good. So let's say you're going to have a contralateral, all those upper motor neuron signs, uh, contralateral, Babinski, Clonus, Hoffman, uh, increased patella, bicep reflex, loss of abdominal reflex. Now you've got your cortical ball bars. Mm. Contralateral deviating tongue with no atrophy. Contralateral weakness below the eyes. Uh, contralateral problems with your face below the eyes with no atrophy. That leaves us with the darn uvula and the jaw. Well, cortical bulbars to nucleus ambiguous are mm, good. So the uvula is standing tall, and cortical bulbars to motor five are mm, good. So your jaws, open your jaw, it's on the midline. Isn't it amazing how that, corti that those cortical bulbars and cortical spinals just keep coming back to you? Oh, here it is, blood supply to A, cingular gyrus. Anterior cerebral. Uh, a, let's put a, a B. What's B? Oh, B. Well, this would be middle cerebral, sorry. And C is posterior cerebral. I'm sorry. I'm so unorganized, but I'm tired. All right, let's keep going. Oh, again, this darn thing here. Lateral geniculate body. Why do you keep harping on this lateral geniculate body? Because we love it. We love it. And I already spent a lot of time on this. Lateral genicular body. Of course, it looks like Napoleon's hat. 
you got to think Napoleon's head would be right here, and you're looking at Napoleon from the side. This would be, you know, depending. So here's here's part of the hat going up like that. Let's say he's looking this way. So Napoleon's head would be here. So this would be the front part of the hat. This would be the caudal part, back part of the hat. Napoleon's hat. And I spent a lot of time on this slide, oh, about 20 minutes ago. Oh, and this one, i got to end up on this one because I love it. This my The OTPT class that I taught in the fall gave me this on the last day of class because they loved level three. And uh, I know that uh, I know that all of you are thinking, oh, he's, is he going to ask me something on level three? Because I forgot everything on level three. So I thought, what can I what can I do to kind of send you off for the exam to kind of keep you thinking about level three? So I picked the biggest thing on level three, and I picked something that is involved in motor learning, motor learning. Um, now, the all of those cerebellar fibers cross and go up through, isn't this cool, the inferior cerebellar peduncle to go to the opposite cerebellum. So the olive is going to modulate the learning in my contralateral side of my cerebellum. All right, and there, the inferior olive is the sole source of climbing fibers. Climbing fibers will go into the cerebellum and go to the entire cerebellum. They will give a twig to the deep nuclei. And then they will climb up that Purkinje cell and have a major, major role in modulating the firing of that Purkinje cell and in modifying, when, it, when these climbing fibers fire, they modify those parallel fiber synapses that are coming in. Remember the, the uh, Mossy fiber comes in, turns on a granule cell, granule cell goes up and splits, and those are your parallel fibers. So climbing fibers can modulate the parallel fiber synapses on Purkinje cells. But remember, it's crossed, cross pathway. Let me see here. Answer is near the body of a famous bone. Amen. What's C got to do with anything? A lesion in the structure shown by the results in a loss of learning when the man tries to do the latest dance with his contra, or oh, oh, contra or ipsy arm and leg. Oh, yeah, contra. That's what the, there's a C right there on my dirty T-shirt. Well, you know, my wife goes out of town a lot. Now, I, you know, eventually I run out of T-shirts. And uh, so it's a little dirty and it's kind of hanging down, but, you know. Let's see what else we can see in here. Oh, here's the etiomiscus, right? Oh, I mean the medial lemniscus. Here's your pyramid. Here's your hypoglossal. Well, you're all tracing this hypoglossal nucleus now. You know it. You've seen it. You know where it's coming from. It comes right down here. It comes right down by the evial miscus. Between the olive and the pyramid, comes out right there. Uh, what else would we have in here that's interesting? Well, let's see now. Um, hmm. In here would be the ALS. You know that. Descending hypothalamics, then we'd have, I don't know, this is supposed to show nucleus ambiguous here, and of course medial to nucleus ambiguous would be the superior or inferior salivatory. Well, it'd be the inferior, because of cranial nerve 9. Remember that? Cranial nerve 9. Boy, you better know that lesser petrosal. Uh, what else is in here? I can't even see solitarius. I don't know what all this is in here. i tell you what, this is a big cookie. I ate some of this cookie, and then my wife broke it up into a hundred pieces and put it in the refrigerator and we just finished it. So every night I'd have a little ice cream and a little chunk of this, of the cookie that yeah, kept it. All the little chunks were in the fridge and we ate it for like months. It was wonderful. I especially enjoyed in, um, eating the olive. The pyramid I didn't enjoy. Edial lemniscus, edial, like eating lemniscus. The hypoglossal was tasty, but anyway. So I'll sign off. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you watch this review, you will not miss a question on the exam. So I wish you all luck, good luck. Talk to you later.